economist, and this is a talk about economics. But wait, don't turn off, don't press the next button, hear me out. Look, I get it. I know that when the topic of economics comes up, most people shut off. And I'm pretty sure I'm not what you picture when you think about a chief economist at a major financial institution. You know, a Taylor Swift-loving millennial, mom to a mischievous toddler. But that's not your fault. We're taught that economics is a dry, complicated, and sometimes heartless field. I'm here to tell you that actually, economics is accessible to each and every one of us. And if you open up to the field, you might discover something even more powerful within yourself. Let's start with the biggest misconception about economics, that it's strictly about money. Even if you look up the definition of economics, it'll tell you it's about the production, consumption, and transfer of wealth. Boring. And kind of wrong. A better definition of economics, the one I've always subscribed to, is that it's the study of the allocation of scarce resources in a given constraint. Okay, also a little boring, but so much more universal. Basically, economics is the study of what we do with things that we have in limited supply and when we're given rules around how to use them. Sure, money is one thing that most of us don't have an unlimited amount of, but what about the planet or the scarcest resource of all, time? Economics studies all of these things and more, but economics is complicated, right? Don't you need a PhD, maybe a beard, a library with leather-bound books? No. Let me show you. Let's break down the most fundamental concept in economics, supply and demand. The idea that when supply is low and demand is high, prices rise and vice versa. Okay, you're picturing your Econ 101 textbooks, your stomach is dropping, but I bet you understand the concept of supply and demand just as well as any professionally working economist. You know who's not a professionally working economist? My husband. He's pretty much the farthest thing from it. He's a painter, an artist, and he's also a sneakerhead. Now, to me, a sneaker is a sneaker. But to him, the world of sneakers is a complex web of limited edition drops and competition for the most coveted pairs. He'll be the first to tell you that if a very rare sneaker is released, very little supply, but everybody wants them, lots of demand, well, those sneakers could be worth anywhere from $300 to $1,000. But a regular old pair of tennis shoes available at any mall, tons of supply, little demand, well, those $50, $60 max. See, my husband, the artist, well, he's also an everyday economist. And so are you. You make complex economic decisions every day. Sometimes they're pretty subtle. Like, have you ever gone to a store and pulled a product off the shelf and then thought, you know what, I'll just check on Amazon to see if it's cheaper? And sometimes, large, disruptive forces make those economic choices more obvious to us. I remember in the depths of the pandemic seeing people lined up down the street to purchase coveted toilet paper at twice the price, coming out of the stores feeling victorious. These people understood. Very little supply, tons of demand equals very expensive toilet paper. Here's another idea that's central to economics that seems complicated, but is actually pretty straightforward. So lately, economists have become concerned that our economies are slowing. You know, back in the 1970s and 80s, North American economies could easily grow at 3, 4, or 5%. And those were considered good numbers associated with prosperity. Lately, our economies have been growing at 2% or below. It seems 
we've just lost the ability to grow like we used to. We call an economy's ability to grow its potential growth rate. And economists measure it as the change in labor force participation rate plus the change in productivity. OK, I'm already bored, too. So you know what? Let's just throw out the formulas. And from now on, when you think of an economy, I want you to picture your favorite burger joint. Yes. And the growth rate of that burger joint is really simply, how many burgers can it make? That's always going to be a function of two things. First, how many people work behind the counter, your labor force, and second, how fast can each one make a hamburger? Your productivity. If you followed this far, boom, you understand the concept of an economy and its potential growth rate. And here comes the fun part. Once we know what our potential is, the next step is to live up to it, both as individuals, but also in our economies at large. You know, I have this memory of coming home from school one day with a C minus on my math test and my mom taking away my TV privileges for the day. But then the next day, my brother came home with a C minus on his history test and we all went to Pizza Hut to celebrate. I remember asking my mom, what's going on? She said, well, sweetheart, I have different estimates of your potential. See, my mom, at the time, a stay-at-home parent, though she easily could have been CEO of a multinational if she wanted to be, she was also an everyday economist. How do we make sure that our economies are not just living up to their potential, but growing their potential over time? Well, in my mind, we need to have some pretty big conversations about affordable and accessible childcare, public transportation, competitiveness, and even reskilling and retooling our economy towards a more sustainable and inclusive future. That's our real economic potential. Sustainable, inclusive, not typically words associated with the dry, dreary world of economics. I remember being a 17-year-old who questioned whether economics was the right choice for me. If I became an economist, would I be complicit in a system that, in many ways, is deeply flawed? I even remember an early economics teacher telling me economics is a positive discipline, not a normative discipline. Or put differently, economics just studies the way the world is, not how it should be. But I am so happy that 17-year-old me took that leap because now I know economists can be change makers. And just as all architects don't believe that all buildings are beautiful or all artists don't love every piece of art, not all economists agree that the economy is as it should be or even agree on the best ways to fix it. There are entire subfields of economics devoted to improving the way the world works. There's Environmental economics, which seeks to preserve our planet. Stratification economics, which studies income and racial inequalities. Feminist economics, which looks into issues like the male-female wage gap. See, not only is economics something that we can all understand, there is a place for all of us in it. So I haven't been entirely upfront. This is not just a talk about economics. This is a talk about facing subjects that seem daunting, like economics, head on, about not turning off or pressing next. This is a talk about knowing that no subject, no field, no title has intellectual superiority over you. Next time you come against something that feels complicated, do like you did today. Don't shut off, engage. If somebody uses a term you don't understand, bravely ask them to put it into terms that you do. Find people that make intimidating topics accessible to you, whether it's your neighbor who loves to talk about accounting or your uncle the mechanic or Bill Nye the science guy. Ask questions and don't hold back just because you think you should know something that you don't. Chances are, you'll probably catch on pretty quick. This is a critical moment 
in our history. There will be more critical moments ahead. It's going to be hard. But if you can learn economics in 10 minutes, you can do hard. You have all of the tools, and now I hope the confidence that you need.